Good afternoon. My name is Erica Crespo with the Anti-Cancer Lifestyle Program. And with me today, I have Crystal Cassio, registered dietitian and health coach and our program's diet expert and the recent host of our Diet Learning Circle. How are you, Crystal? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for asking. So we are here today to go through a bit of a rapid fire round of questioning for Crystal using some of the most popular questions we received during our recent virtual learning circle. A little background about learning circles in case you're not familiar. They're intimate virtual events that we hold monthly and they are essentially free hour long conversations with our course experts just like Crystal. If you've gone through or are in the process of going through our online transformation course, these circles are for you. Maybe you have questions about what you've learned or are learning a desire for clarification or simply want to optimize your anti-cancer lifestyle with the very experts who helped us build our course. So we recently held our diet learning circle. And like I said, the questions I'll be asking Crystal today are some of the most popular ones that came in. All right, I have my first question for you, Crystal. And canned fruits and veggies versus fresh fruits and veggies, is one better than the other? Great question. So I would actually want to recommend, in, in, as an, a nice alternative to canned, frozen. Um, can the issue when it get when we get into just thinking about anti-cancer living and trying to minimize chemicals that we might be exposed to that um, might be harmful to health when we get into canned products some of the things they use in the lining like BPA of cans mm -hmm. can there's a good amount of research showing some of these chemicals can be quite harmful to us so something I'd actually recommend in you know fresh is always a wonderful option um, but instead of fresh especially when fruits and veggies you know protein Produce is not in season, buying frozen can be a wonderful option. And a lot of times frozen um, research has found has as much nutrients that, as fresh because they pick the, the produce and then freeze. Um, so there's not much time, you know, going by before the freezing process when the produce is picked. So I would actually recommend considering frozen versus canned um, just to limit your exposure to some of the chemicals that might be in the can. And, you know, in canned produce, a lot of times, like for canned fruit, they're adding a lot of sugar. So being mindful of that, whereas frozen fruit, there's no sugar added. And when we get into canned vegetables, a lot of times food companies add a ton of sodium, whereas in most frozen vegetables, you're not going to have added added sodium. I think sometimes in peas, like frozen peas, you might find added sodium or salt, um, but overall in canned, you're going to get more risk for like canned fruits, the sugar they're adding. So be being mindful of that and the salts in canned uh, vegetables. Nice. And frozen uh, fruits are so good in smoothies too. I use them all the time. So added bonus. Yes. Next question. What is the role of a plant-based diet in cancer prevention? So it actually is recommended for, for cancer prevention. So when we look at nutrition guidelines for cancer prevention, the focus sheet should be primarily on a plant-based diet. This is what the research supports. So what does that mean? You know, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds, legumes, which includes beans, peas, lentils. Um, so really going for more whole, minimally processed or, you know, just um, whole foods, plant-based foods. These should be the emphasis when we're looking at an anti-cancer diet diet for cancer mm -hmm. prevention. So it's, it's, and that's pretty much, you know, when I look at the question, what is the role of plant-based diet in cancer prevention? Um, that is the recommendation when it comes to nutrition for cancer prevention. So definitely more plants, less animals is recommended. So when we're talking about plants and we're talking about eating organic fruits and veggies, what if someone can't purchase an organic option? Is it better to just avoid it? Great question. I hear this a lot and I always like to clear this up because at the end of the day, eating more fruits and vegetables is better than not eating them. So do not not eat something because it's not organic. So still get your produce in, your plants in, fruits and veggies. However, there's definitely um, resources that could be really helpful for purchasing organic on a budget. I know the Anti-Cancer Lifestyle Program and the Diet Module has a ton of tips on this. Um, just briefly, the Environmental Working Group's Dirty Dozen that they publish each, uh, each year going over the you know dozen produce items that you 
might want to consider purchasing organic mm -hmm. since there have been found to be pesticides, um, a significant amount of pesticides on those produce items compared to the Clean 15, which they also publish, which are produce items that, um, you know, have lower risk for pesticide exposure. So in summary, still eat your fruits and vegetables if they're not organic, but if you can, finding ways to, um, you know, purchase organic on a budget and the anti-cancer lifestyle program has a, just a ton of tips on that in the diet module. So we talked about um, how a plant-based diet could help with cancer prevention, but are there specific foods that you would say are anti-cancer foods? Ooh, yes. Um, I would say most plant-based foods, like what first comes to mind is fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, whole grains, legumes, what I mentioned earlier. Um, however, I would say specifically when we get into our um, green orange, yellow, uh, red produce items, we're getting something called carotenoids in, in those produce items when you're seeing that color, like a red bell pepper or mm -hmm. green kale or, um, you know, all of these like tomatoes, the red color, these, these certain colors, that's a clue that you're getting carotenoids, which are anti-cancer compounds um, and really beneficial for our, our health and well-being. Also, alliums, I want to just kind of highlight. So that includes uh, garlic, especially fresh garlic, which has allicin, which is an anti-cancer compound, leeks, onions, shallots. So any plant in the allium family is absolutely going to be an anti-cancer food. Also, what comes to mind is cruciferous vegetables. Um, I always love saying that word. I don't know why <laughs> cruciferous vegetables, but that's like your broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, kale, radishes. Um, I feel like there's like, there's definitely more cruciferous vegetables, but those are some of the main ones. And the cruciferous vegetables have anti-cancer compounds um, called glucosinolates, which are really beneficial for health and well-being. They're anti-inflammatory. Again, they have anti-cancer properties. So I would definitely recommend those, like the cruciferous vegetable category as um, to kind of just giving it a little extra highlight as anti-cancer uh, anti -cancer foods. Um, I would say to herbs and spices, especially ginger and turmeric, given their anti-inflammatory mm -hmm. effects and as a result, anti-cancer properties. And it's not that comes to mind right now, but I would say most whole plant foods are going to have um, nutrients that are really helpful for um, minimizing our risk for cancer. Cruciferous. Did I say it right? Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah. I'll say it together. Cruciferous. <laughs> Cruciferous. I love it. <laughs> All right. What about sugar? What role does sugar play in inflammation? So when we look at studies that show, you know, which foods have been associated with increased levels of inflammation in the body and foods that have been associated with decreased levels of inflammation in the body, a diet that's high in sugar and when I say sugar, I'm not talking about the sugar that's found naturally in fruit, right? Like fruit sugar, fructose. I'm talking about the sugar that's in processed foods. So sugary beverages, cookies, mm -hmm. cakes, pastries, sweets, et cetera, um, sugary cereals. So these more processed foods, that sugar consumption of, of um, you know, a diet high in sugar, you know, especially from these processed foods has been associated with increased levels of, of inflammation in the body. Now, why is that without spending too much time getting into hormones and metabolism? Um, you know, it could cause blood sugar spikes, which can increase insulin, insulin like growth factor, which those play a role in inflammation. Um, mm -hmm. Some of these hormones and, and, you know, blood sugar regulation plays a role in inflammation. So we want to maintain blood sugar within a healthy range, spikes in blood sugar can increase inflammation. So um, hopefully that answers that question. So we hear a lot about chicken and fish and that they're good for us, but how much should we be eating? So yeah, that's a really good question. When it comes to chicken and fish, at, le at least when considering cancer prevention nutrition mm -hmm. guidelines, there's no exact amount that everyone should be eating. Like there's no number I could say, you know, mm. I think we really want to be mindful of, um, of course, when we're thinking, as I spoke about a little bit earlier of, uh, anti-cancer diet or, you know, eating well for cancer prevention when it comes to nutrition, less animal products, more plants. So I would say, you know, 
when it comes to poultry, we still, it's an animal product, right? So we want to consider um, reduction and, and just more plants and of course quality. So mm -hmm. choosing organic, better quality animal products, but there's no exact number that I could give for everyone for poultry. There's just not enough evidence and the, the recommendations specifically for cancer prevention just aren't there right now, but we do want to encourage better quality, more plants. And when it comes to fish, um, you know, I've, I've heard general recommendations of, you know, two times a week of fatty fish. And again, when it comes for to cancer specifically, there's no exact recommendation that I could give. So I, I want to be clear about that. But I do want to be clear that um, being mindful, if you are having fish, I think this is really important. Mm -hmm. We want to choose low mercury fish and fish that has not been contaminated with heavy metals. So generally speaking, you know, cold water fish, fatty fish to get those omega-3s, um, anti-inflammatory fats in there. Um, so avoiding things like, you know, swordfish, um, so some of the more high mercury fish like tuna, frequent consumption of tuna has been associated with um, just have, having high levels of mer mercury in the body. The Environmental Working Group has a wonderful seafood purchasing guide that I highly recommend where you can put in your information and see what seafood will be safe for you. The Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch guide is really wonderful as well. Just a really great resource for consumers. So I just want to be just mention that, especially when it comes to fish, since I have had some clients eating um, with a history of cancer or mm -hmm. just looking to reduce their risk, eating large amounts of fish that's actually high in mercury. So you just want to be mindful of that. So choosing lower mercury mm -hmm. options such as, um, you know, salmon comes to mind. So mm -hmm. that's also high in omega-3s, but just some things to consider there, but there's no um, exact res recommendations when it comes to cancer prevention. So we had a lot of questions about dairy during our learning circle, which is where this question comes from. Is dairy, even organic dairy, unhealthy for cancer survivors? And I guess let's just open that up, anyone. Yeah, so when it comes to, you know, I'll speak for cancer specifically, and also for, for anyone, it, the answer is pretty much the same. There is no evidence suggesting that, you know, we should not be having dairy at all. Now, mm -hmm. Keeping that in mind, dairy is an animal product, right? And we do know for specifically cancer and again, overall health and wellness too, I would argue that more plants, less animal products, very beneficial considering how can we use animal products to complement the plants, right? Mm -hmm. So to maybe in small amounts for flavor, um, you know, I think of as an example of that, like some feta, like organic, good quality cheese, like feta cheese sprinkled on a salad that's really abundant in plants. So you're getting that flavor, that mouthfeel of the fat. Um, dairy does give us some nutrients, right? It's nothing to, to fear by any means or feel like you can't have it. But because it is an animal food, you know, we still want to make the most the focus mostly plants. Um, mm -hmm. And then of course, quality, just like with the poultry, right? We talked about, you know, organic, better quality. We still wanna keep that in mind when it comes to dairy. So consuming dairy that's not coming from animals treated with growth promoters, hormones, or just raised in not very healthy ways because that's reflected in the meat and the milk. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, in general, I would say when it comes to dairy, there's no exact recommendations. You by no means have to avoid it. And I think dairy is very individualized. Like a lot of mm -hmm. times I, when I'm working one-on-one -on -one with someone is where we can really get a sense is, is dairy serving them? Um, you know, a lot of people don't tolerate dairy well digestive wise. So if I'm working with someone who has um, digestive issues, reflux, gas, bloating, et cetera, mm -hmm. um, dairy for some people may not be the best for them. So I think it's just about listening to your body, learning what works best for you, and then still making the focus mostly plants and better quality dairy for sure. We hear a lot about GMOs all the time. So what is your opinion on GMOs? Sure. So when it comes to GMOs or genetically modified organisms, essentially, the at least when I'm thinking about these foods, what I'm concerned is the chemicals that are sprayed on these foods, because a mm -hmm. lot of GMO foods, such as corn and soybeans, are being genetically engineered to be resistant to harmful chemicals such as glyphosate and an herbicide. And that has been the World Health 
organization has found it to be a probable carcinogen. So when it comes to GMO foods, I do recommend choosing um, non-GMO foods and organic foods actually are naturally non-GMO. You know, the GMOs can't be in organic foods. So it's something I, I do recommend mostly because of the chemicals that are being sprayed on these foods that have been shown to have a lot of um, concerns and potential negative health effects. So going back to, to fish for a second, is there a best type of fish to eat that you know of? You know, I think the cold water, wild caught, generally speaking, right? I'm not, mm -hmm. I think we still have to consider sustainability, um, fish that are overfished, and that's where the Monterey Bay Aquarium Guide is really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. But generally speaking, you know, wild caught, cold water fish, the fatty fish like salmon, mackerel, halibut, sardines, anchovies, I'm sure there's more off the top of my head I'm not thinking of, um, but your cold water fatty fish, um, wild caught, preferable to farm raise. Um, and yeah, so I would say, I would say get some variety with your fish too. I feel like a lot of people eat fish and they just have salmon. They're like, I'm right. going to eat two times a week and I'm just going to go with wild caught <laughs> salmon. And wild caught salmon is wonderful, but you could, you know, there's plenty of other fish out there that are um, low in mercury, high in protein, healthy fats like omega-3s and nutrients mm. such as zinc, iodine. So um, I do encourage, you know, a variety of fish. And I would say just, again, being mindful of those high, high mercury fish. We, we really want to avoid or limit. So my last question for you today has to do with gut health, Crystal. What are your thoughts on probiotic supplements versus probiotic rich foods? Oh, I love, this is like one of my favorite topics. I love gut health. So when it comes to probiotic supplements versus foods, I think, I think there could be, and this is where I, I, when it comes to supplements, working one-on-one -on -one with someone, like mm -hmm. generally speaking, without knowing your medical history, your what medications you're on, what digestive, what your digestive health is like currently, mm -hmm. it would be so hard to know what kind of probiotic to recommend. Like sometimes probiotic supplements can be helpful for certain conditions. The strain matters, you know, depending on what you're trying to, to have a probiotic for. So it's not, you know, sometimes I have also seen that someone will just start a probiotic supplement and it exacerbated their digestive symptoms, which could happen. So mm -hmm. for example, a lot of my patients who experience bloating and irritable bowel syndrome um, start probiotics and it like adds more fuel to the fire. It actually mm. makes things worse for them. So that I would say when it comes to probiotic supplements, I'm not saying there's not a time or a place for them or that they they may, you know, that they can't be beneficial. They're, they very well might play a role in um, just supporting your gut health, but definitely work one on one with someone for that to get a personalized recommendation. Um, you know, with your health, someone as a member of your, your healthcare team, um, a registered dietitian can help you with this. And something mm -hmm. I also want to say about the probiotic supplements is that, you know, I think we touch on this a little bit in the learning circle, but um, just really reinforce this that the supplements aren't regulated. So right. I've had some people taking supplements, you know, whether it's protein powders or probiotic supplements or multivitamins and lo and behold, from the databases, the professional databases I use to, to check have these supplements been tested independently mm -hmm. to see if they're safe. I've had a number of people taking supplements that they thought were healthy. And then the supplement was found to be contaminated with heavy metals or just have excessive doses of things that you don't want. So because they're not regulated, I do recommend before taking anything, like really meet with someone and go through, okay, what brands are considered mm -hmm. safe? What brands have been tested? What condition or digestive symptom am I trying to treat with a probiotic? Because what I would mm -hmm. recommend for diarrhea is going to be um, much different than what I would recommend for constipation or, you know, reflux or whatever it might be based on the research right. with specific strains of, of probiotics. Um, so that being said, when it comes to probiotic rich foods, there's a, I, I, I'm usually encouraging, especially if you have not spoken with someone about starting supplements yet. Mm -hmm. I always say like food first, like incorporating more probiotic rich foods and was kind of amazing. It just, I think it just goes to show the power of, of food and plants is that you can get more 
probiotics and a tablespoon of something like sauerkraut than you can in many of these probiotic supplements. So a a little bit goes a long way. Um, That includes foods like sauerkraut, kimchi using in cooking, tempeh, uh, fermented soybeans, actually it's a source of probiotics, kefir, yogurt, if you tolerate dairy, and there's also non-dairy versions of these if you don't tolerate dairy very well. So I'm a big proponent of a food first approach with this. And Mm. again, not to just say there's no time and place for a supportive probiotic supplement, but that really has to be individualized. I appreciate hearing that, a food first approach. That's a, a good way to think of this. Well, thank you, Crystal, for your time today. Everyone, we have our next learning circle coming up on April 6th. It will be focused on our mindset module and we hope to see you there. Crystal, thank you so much for joining me today and I hope you have a great evening. Thank you for having me.